Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Get to Know Her show. I am your host, Monica Graves. I'm so happy you're here today. It's a beautiful sunny day in Burlington, Ontario. We woke up to snow, which got me in the Christmas mode. Have you started shopping or are you like me? I haven't even thought about it yet. But if you're thinking about it and you need a little something something for yourself, I want you to check out our sponsor Brenda Bedome at brendabedome.com and use the coupon code get to know her for 21% off of your order and you can get a cute cozy little sweater like Mimi with these beautiful tapered sleeves and our three little wishes necklace happens to go perfectly with it. Thank you so much for all of your purchases. We have raised $700 for Paul Robinson and his family. Paul is um, a young man who we are helping this year through our Three Little Wishes program. And uh, he has a cancerous brain tumor and we're doing everything we can to raise as much money as possible for him and his family. So thank you for all your likes and your shares and all of that good stuff. Um, I also have something new that I treated myself to. Uh, this cute little pink flamingo mug who is um, I actually got it from a wonderful company I follow on Instagram and they are called all underscore out 905 on Instagram and it's all beautiful little vintage items so go and check them out pick something out for yourself and uh, yeah treat yourself why not and then start your Christmas shopping so today I have Heather Gordon with me and I'm going to bring her on in just a minute, but let me introduce you to her. Heather is currently the managing director for the global podcast company, Acast. Heather was brought on board by Acast in September, 2020 to launch the market and drive advertising revenue. Prior to Acast, Heather spent five years at the CBC and before that with Canada's largest media outlets, including Chum and Bell Media, where she worked on dynamic brands like Much Music and MTV. A mom of two and published author of two children's books, I Am Lazarus, A Goat Story, and Does the Queen Fart? I am thrilled to chat with Heather and learn more about her exciting career and where she gathers her inspiration. Let's bring her on. Hello, Heather. Hi. How are you on this snowy day? Do you have snow in Toronto? Um, you yeah, a little bit, like a dusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. Gets us in the mood. Yes, it gets the yeah, kids in the mood. Yeah, sure. exactly. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so happy to chat with you. There's so much here. You are a multifaceted person with all kinds of things happening. Lots to do. <laughs> Lots to do. So I want to start off with the very first question I ask all of my guests, and that is, what did little Heather want to be when she grew up? Oh, good question. You know, I don't recall <laughs> being overly ambitious as a child, um, as a youth, and certainly not in high school. Um, I was, I don't know how typical it was, but not that driven, um, should apply myself more. Um, you know, I look back at a number of years where I could have just sat in a class and learned for for years with nothing and no other responsibilities, but I, I didn't take advantage of it. Um, it wasn't until I was a little older that I, I, you know, I found my ambition. So I didn't, I don't even remember or recall having anything that I dreamt of career wise when I was younger. Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. I, I remember that too. Like I think back to high school and all of the richness of what they were teaching us. And all I could think of was like, get me out of the class, need to plan a party, totally. what's going on on the weekend. Totally. And yeah, amazing. So this, this also explains what sort of led you into um, the career that you're in now and all of the stepping stones to get there, like sometimes I think people like you who are so excel so much in sales and communications and that type of work, you know, um, I think that a lot of times that comes from kids who are what just want to do. I was yeah. crazy that you're you're asking an eighteen year old to decide what career path they want to go down. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. the way it goes. But um, yeah. yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved media and I knew I loved much music and I knew I loved city TV. 
Um, yeah. So it, it wasn't a hard um, bridge to imagine a career where I was somewhere behind the ca behind the camera in a creative role. So that was ultimately where I, the direction I headed in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, not a lot of um, get up and go in, in my earlier years. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And also, you know, Heather, I'm thinking too, because we're around the same, we're pretty much the same age, you and I. Yeah. And, and I remember back at that time, like, just figuring out what sort of jobs were available in any yeah. industry. Now I feel like we have so many options. There's so much information coming at us. So how did you sort of figure out where you were going to go, what you were going to study, how you were going to get there. Did you have a mentor who kind of helped you to track that or? No, I just, I, I, I knew I wanted to be in media somehow. So I went to college for media mm -hmm. um, fundamentals and then, you know, uh, video, audio, television um, and all those various forms of media. And then when I got out of college, I was a bartender in a, a downtown nightclub and I'd moved to Toronto um, and just started volunteering at, at CHUM. Um, so it was a free internship. Uh, I wasn't paid, so I was bartending until three in the morning and then I'd have my butt in the chair at 9 a.m. Um, and ultimately just showed up each day and, and learned how um, what I needed to do in order to, to become a paid um, employee. So okay. you know, they started giving me a couple hundred bucks a week, and uh, ultimately, eventually, I became a, a full-time employee and was was able to give up the the night job, um, even yeah. though the money was really good, um, and just sort of grew it from there. So you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, knew the building I wanted to do it in, got into that building, um, and then just sort of went from there. That's great. So, what was your first paying job? Um, a, at Chum. Yeah. yeah, I was a uh, the office assistant for City Interactive. So the interactive group, which of course now are ubiquitous, that everybody's got a a website, everybody's has got some sort of digital presence in the in the media space. But this was when MuchMusic.com launched, so they were just starting out um, and just building a division. So that was my entry into the building. Oh, exciting. That's fantastic. So, and in that role, did you, did you meet a lot of celebrities? I met did you some. Have I did met you? some, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, you, did, did you meet anybody where you were like, oh my God, I've always, you know, were you starstruck at any point? Yeah, there, there were people <laughs> that came into the building that mm -hmm. I was starstruck by, like Bowie, um, oh. you know, like just spectacular human beings that I, I didn't get to, to see, but I knew they were in the building. Like you'd run into, you know, who would I run into? Like, um, you know, the lead singer of Bush, Gavin Rossdale, I ran into him in the hallway. You just meet these weird people and, and you're walking by, you're like, oh, that's the guy from Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it was a really yeah. fun person to work in, a lot of great energy um, oh. and, and a lot of really, really brilliant, creative people pass through those doors. Yeah. Um, which was an exciting environment to, to be in, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. I have to share with you in 2005 and 2006, um, with my jewelry business, I actually, I was in the uh, Much Music gift lounge. Hi. And yeah, and, and Wayne, my husband, who you know, we were back there and we were gifting the stars. And I don't know about you, Heather, but the one thing that really stuck out for me was like how tiny they were because when we yeah. see them on tv or whatever it's like they seem larger than life and i'm like oh my gosh these people are so little you know yeah, there, like, are, there are some ones that you're like oh Tom Cruise, <laughs> you're very small um yeah. and then the odd one surprises you or you're like ah, oh, you're actually really tall yeah. um but yeah there it, it is known that a lot of them are, are quite petite like prince tiny 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 yeah but no, no one thinks that he's he's anything but you know yeah sure order profile. <laughs> exactly. I, I had uh, one person wear my jewels on the red carpet and it was the lead, uh, not the lead singer, I think the lead guitar player from the Trues. <laughs> he, it was hilarious. Yeah, he was like this whole Jim Morrison look, so he was into my That's beads fantastic. and stuff. And are you yeah, still yeah. in the jewelry business? Yeah, still in the jewelry business. Yeah, for sure. And then Amazing. I started the talk show with the pandemic. So it's so fun to, you know, 
I, yeah, I'm just so excited to chat with you and hear about this career and how you've moved along. And now you're in the podcast realm. Yes. You know, so is that new for you, Heather, like as of 2020, or were you um, already kind of working in that we, before? We had uh, at the CBC, um, mm -hmm. we had a, a, a slate of spectacular podcasts. CBC is obviously uh, very strong in the audio category, um, mm -hmm. very strong in radio, obviously. So um, it was a no brainer for them to be very successful in storytelling in the podcast space. So that's ultimately where I fell in love with podcasts. Um, and, uh, and it was so through the CBC that I met my current employer, ACAST, and uh, I was ready for a move and, and was more than happy to, to move full time into the, the podcast world. Great. So tell us about your role at ACAST. I'm, cu I'm curious because this is also, I, I mean, I know podcasts yeah. have been happening for a while now, but it's, it's still such a new and exciting platform and totally. Yeah. So, um, at ACAST, we, uh, our goal in Canada, so there's offices set up in major cities around the world, but our goal in Canada is to find uh, unique podcast voices, um, mm -hmm. uh, get them onto the ACAST platform. So we host their podcast and then we help the podcasters make money uh, via the sales of advertising within those podcasts. So we've got you know a, a few different goals to find, elevate, and monetize the podcast. So, um, you know, that, that could take the form in finding somebody. Uh, we recently signed uh, a podcast with Fred Van Vliet from the Toronto Raptors. So okay. he very much is not a podcaster. He's a, he's an athlete and a very good athlete, mm -hmm. um, but was interested in, in creating a podcast, um, about, uh, being a BIPOC entrepreneur. So he has found uh, BIPOC entrepreneurs across Canada and he interviews them with his business partner and um, listens to their story, helps them make some decisions, hopefully helps them along their way in their journey. Um, and, and that's a great example of finding someone that isn't a podcaster and bringing them onto the platform. And we have a partner with Intuit, um, oh, okay. with TurboTax and QuickBooks, yeah. who is the sponsor that helps fund it. So. Um, that's kind of the goal is to to find Canadians and and give them a platform to uh, to spread their their podcast. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. And do they have to meet a certain requirement? Or I, I was on I I went on your Acast website last night just to sort of see how it was set up. And and I know there's different plans. Like there's a free yes. plan, and then there's something a little more advanced, and then you have two more yeah, above that. I think. Yeah, they, they, it's hard to bucket people based on listens because mm -hmm. everybody's different and unique, but they, they, you know, if you're a larger podcast, um, uh, if you're larger in terms of the, the reach and the amount of listens you get, you do fall into a different category, um, in terms of, uh, working with ACAST, but, you know, we often work with smaller voices if they fulfill our mandate, if they're, if it's mm -hmm. a voice that, um, has an amazing story to tell, that just hasn't had the opportunity or didn't know how to launch a podcast or has a, has a podcast but really had no idea of how to find a voice, we might get behind that and support it just because we feel like it's a voice that deserves to be to be heard. Right. Um, so there, it's, it's a gray area um, in terms of, you know, who, who we get behind. But anybody can be on ACAST platform. Um, it's just different levels of partnership with us, I guess. Um, okay. But uh, but yeah, it, it depends on a bunch of different things. Yeah, that's so interesting. So Heather, in your opinion, what do you think makes for a really great podcast? I, I mean, just the a story, the, the story, the, the there's so many things. It's mm -hmm. um, it's the delivery of of the narrator. It's the host. It's the guests. It's the chemistry. It's the ability to tell a story. Um, you know, we've got podcasters that um, random order comes to mind. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Some, a couple Canadian guys that have a very big YouTube channel and following, um, have a podcast and they have this ability to chat about the most mundane things in their life. And they just wax about it for about five minutes about a, a pizza delivery. They were try trying to pick up a pizza and they're just fun and engaging storytellers and they can take an audience on a journey. Um, and that's a gift, right? So yes. It, it it depends on the kind of podcast, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, whether, you know, it's it's aiming to entertain or inform. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if it's, if it's just meant to make you laugh, obviously a criteria of a good podcast would then be, it has to make you laugh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, and yeah. accuracy, the news is, you know, we don't need to turn on cable news to understand that there's a lot of misinformation and you have to build trust. Mm -hmm. um, and trust comes with time. So yeah, there's lots of different factors depending on the, the, your category that you're, you're creating it, but consistency is important. So if you are in comedy, stick with comedy. If you are on factual, stick with factual, you know? So right. Yeah. About being consistent. So an audience knows what to expect from you. Right. That's so great. You know, I, uh, as you're talking about like the chemistry between two people and, and all those sorts of things, I'm just, I can't help but think of back, you know, in, in our high school days when, you know, we were first learning to drive and you're out with your best friend and you go to drop them off. And then you have this like amazing one or two hour conversation in the car and the, and it's just like, nobody wants to leave because it's so great. And the jokes are flying and everything's hilarious and the inside jokes. And, you know, it's so nice to see podcasters like that, like the ones you're describing where there's this amazing chemistry and, and, you know, especially for the pandemic when people are feeling isolated and not at their best, okay. just, you know, just to have that, it's like having a couple friends in the kitchen that are making you laugh your head off. It, you know, it's exactly it's what it is. So nice. There's an intimacy there to it where you do feel like someone's just chatting with you in your kitchen. Yeah. yeah. And and the listening part too, I love. You know, because it really it takes you through your own imagination of where those people are and what it looks like and what they look like. You know, we even growing up, like we listened to a lot of audio stuff. Like, even, I remember my mom buying us books on records, you know, yeah, and then absolutely. we just sit and close our eyes and imagine what the characters were like. And so it's, I, I get a very similar feeling with a really good podcast. Kind of takes you away. Right? Yeah. 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 So I want to talk to you about your books that you've written yes. and i i do have a little story i wanted to share with you because my husband right. gave me some insight he said before you talk to heather she loves goats and then of goats. course i saw the the title of the first book you wrote but um when i was a little squirt my parents we are of german background and my parents sent me to um and my brother to a camp in kitchener it was like a german camp on a farm yeah and it was wonderful and they had goats there yeah. And my favorite goat, her name was Schneehupfle, which means hopping in the, in the snow. Oh. <laughs> and I had to milk her and we, we drank the goat's milk and it was so, and of all the things I remember, we still, our whole family, we still talk about Schneehupfle. So oh. when I heard you love goats, I was like, oh my God, I, I got to really love goats. <laughs> and why I do you them. love them? Because I saw a picture of a bunch of goats standing in a tree um, and uh, in Morocco, I think. If you Google goats in trees, you'll see yeah. these spectacular pictures of these goats just precariously dangling on tree branches. They're, they're feeding, there's nuts up there. Um, but it, it almost looks magical. And I would encourage you when we get off to, to Google goats and trees. Okay. Um, and so I became a little bit not obsessed, that's a little bit of a heavy of a word, but just really fascinated with these goats and trees um, and uh, and thought it, it it did represent the 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 ability for there to be magic in the world. These little goats all placed, it just looks like a painting um, and something really special. So I, I decided that this was my, the goat book was my second book. Um, okay. And then I wanted to do a book about goats and trees. Um, it, 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 the ultimately the title was changed um, at the the last minute, so the title wasn't Goats and Trees, um, but the 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 idea came from that imagery. And in the book, the ending of the book um, does feature all of the goats that are in the story standing in trees. So it it does come back to that concept of of all of these goats that hang out in trees. It's it's really quite marvelous when you see a picture of it um oh. and uh and i became really fascinated by it so that's where the goat thing came from 
Okay, that's great. So Heather, did you write your books before you had your kids or no, after they were, when they were young? Uh, okay. So um, Does the Queen Fart was five or so years ago, and then okay. maybe four, three or four years ago for I Am Lazarus. So it came in, it, it's something I've always wanted to do. It's, it's um, an arduous process. Kids books are even more arduous because it requires illustrations. Um, okay. It, you know, kids' books are one of those things that seem like they're probably the easiest of all the books to write because there's just a few words and mm -hmm. it's a simple idea, but um, it's actually can be, I, you know, I don't want to say it's the opposite because if you've seen someone writing a novel, my husband's a, a, a novelist, so I have to be careful not to get away the But yeah, they, it is very time consuming and a lot of work. So uh, I had the inspiration for the second one and was like, do I want to do this again? Um, and then that was it. And I felt like I got it out of my system, like just that that creative bent to do something a little different outside of what I have been doing um, historically, right? Right. Well, I would imagine it would be a challenge to write a kid's book because you've got to have humor and you've got to be able to hold their attention as well yeah. in the writing, you know? Like the illustrations will do that too, but uh, yeah, the writing's a big part of it. So sure, it's, yeah, it's, kids are kids are tough customers. Um, yeah. So I went with the fart joke in the first one because kids laugh laugh at farts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. tell us about does the queen fart? Can you tell us about the story? Yeah, it's really simplistic. I I had babies and um, what what there was something that happened at home. Um, oh, I know, we were having. We were having trouble, not having trouble. This is something you learn when you have kids. You mm -hmm. always think you're having trouble toilet training or having trouble walking. None of it's yeah. trouble. It's all <laughs> when they're ready. Um, but there was some, something with Laszlo toilet training. And, um, you know, I, I ended up doing some research. And and the way we talk to our children is, ooh, that stinks. And, ooh, and <laughs> just that kind of thing. But their, their little brains are hearing that my body is doing something. Not to you know, be overly dramatic about it, but right. if you think about it, you're telling your body, telling your kid that their body, which is beautiful and a miracle and all of these wonderful things are creating things that are yucky. Um, yeah. And I realized we've been saying to him, oh, that stinks or, oh, or, I don't want to change that. And, you know, they may be getting the message that their body is less than these perfect yeah. little vessels of greatness. And um, so the idea of was born out of that and the idea being you know if you're eating broccoli and beans and carrots and filling your body with wholesome vegetables your body is supposed to fart um that means it's doing its job and you're you're doing all the right things um so that there's really no shame in um your body doing what it's supposed to do which is you know going number two farting um and then you know who is the the who do you think of when you think of the only the person on the planet that maybe wouldn't fart and it's you know sometimes <laughs> you might think the queen so that's where that that's where the queen came in does the queen fart and of course the queen farts of um, course because that is what the body is supposed to do so that was the, the goal was just making it maybe a little bit more comfortable to 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 celebrate the body and instead of looking at these functions as disgusting. Mm -hmm. Look at those little glorious um, bursts of something, you know, in the right context. Like it's not a license to fart at the dinner table. I'm, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, that's wonderful. And I love the whole thing about, you know, just the, there's so much shaming and, and, you know, stuff we do like that. Nobody, it's, you know, it, it's like, we all do that. We've all done totally that. Good. I don't have Why kids, you, but yeah, everybody's done that stuff. And, and it does send a message. Like yeah, if we just leave them alone. They would go to the bathroom, but it, it's, we interject yeah. ourselves in every little thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And like, he probably would have walked a year ago if you just left him alone. <laughs> <laughs> all we are, Come on, you gotta walk, you gotta walk, stand up, get on, you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And it's like, yeah. just <laughs> let their bodies be their bodies and 
keep your head in. Just things yeah. you learn. For sure. Did, and you did you learn that with your second child? Did you have the whole, was it harder he's, with the first and then? Yeah, because he was, Laszlo took his time. He's like, he's not in any rush. And then mm -hmm. we had Clementine 14 months after Laszlo was born. So it, 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 it ended up working out so that they toilet trained together. Because he was three and she was two or, or whatever the yeah. ages were. I, I can't remember now. But, um, you know, they got off bottles together. She seemed to be ready about the time he was mm -hmm. to make all these transitions, which was wonderful because we were kind of toilet training two kids, weaning off bottles, learning to ride bikes. It, it, it actually worked out really, really well. Oh, that's perfect. I love it. And then, of course, you uh, were writing the books in the meantime. Yeah. As you were yeah. doing all of that. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were a couple yeah. of years old and uh, yeah. I, I'm lucky enough. Like I said, my husband's a, a writer, so he was home and um, very supportive when I was working um, and, uh, and trying to write and also very helpful with me with writing. Like it's very handy to have a, a writer in the house. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. That's great. It's, it, did you end up doing like book tours with those books, Heather? Did you? I did, um, yeah, we, um, nothing extensive. Like I was still yeah. employed at the CBC, which was by my main focus in life. If anything, I, I would call these what a side hustle and just something to, you know, feed that creative need that wasn't being met at, at can you hear my dog making noise? Oh, it's okay. We love okay. dogs. I just, we got a puppy. Um, and Georgette is under the Christmas tree right now. Um, <laughs> making some noise. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so, but so, to, to that end, we had event, yeah. events in uh, Toronto. We went to London for the second one and had a, uh, my husband's English. So we've got a community um, in London as well. So we did a, a launch in London. So just little, oh. nothing, nothing too massive. Book tours in general aren't as prominent as they once were. The book industry is, has changed so much. It's, um, it, it's, it's not the easiest bi business to make a living at. Mm -hmm. um, as everybody knows, book sales aren't great. People are getting their content for free. Um, so yeah, book book tours aren't. Um, aren't that common and certainly not for, for, for my projects, but we did get a trip to London out of it. So I was happy. Oh, that's wonderful. How exciting to, you know, talk about does the queen fart in London? Absolutely. That's so great. So fun. <laughs> I love it. So you have to tell us about your dog now. I'm intrigued. What kind of dog did you get? Do you know what a Brussels Griffin is? Yes. I got a Brussels Griffin. What? Oh, sweet. Oh, yeah. I'll see if she comes by. And, she... Is she, and she's a puppy. How yeah, old is she now? She's actually close to one, uh, but we still refer to that as puppy. Of course, yeah. <laughs> she's actually like a puppy. I can see her right now, and you know you don't want to you don't want to end the puppy days too soon, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Heather, being uh, in the podcast world and Acast, have you ever had a desire to start your own podcast? Is that um, something that I thought about it? But you know, the more I work in podcasts, the more. I appreciate, here, I've got Georgia. Um, oh, here she comes. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh, she's so sweet. Is she a mix? No, that's Brussels Griffin. Oh. They're short hair and long hair. She's short hair. Okay, because my girlfriend has a long haired one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what look like. Oh, she is so sweet. Um, oh. But I appreciate how much work they are uh, yeah. and the dedication. Uh, and again, the consistency, right? It's like, you know, your audience is expecting you to drop a podcast on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. you got to drop a podcast at Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, and it's also hard to find something to keep people engaged for an hour a week. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, you're a content creator. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a big commitment. Um, and, uh, and a lot of podcasts fizzle out. I mean, the majority of them don't last uh mm -hmm. and if you can't monetize them because your audience just isn't growing uh it's typically your second job it's not your main job um ultimately a lot of them end up fizzling out and there's a lot of competition like there are millions of podcasts right so mm -hmm. um it, it's it's a lot of work um to elevate your podcast and get it discovered uh yeah. and chances are unless it is like a unique 
podcast on like Rasputin and, you know, chances are you're competing with a lot of people if you're, if you're doing something on comedy. Um, so it's a, it's a tough biz. I mean, it's great. You don't need NBC to wave their magic wand. Like if you want to create a TV show, it's, you know, it's a very difficult and expensive undertaking. Podcasts are cheap. They're available to everybody, but there's a lot of work involved in, in, um, and getting them launched and, and keeping them published, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's so funny because, um, you know, I've been, I've had my jewelry business for 20 years and uh, I always had this dream that I wanted to start an interview series and talk to female entrepreneurs. Yeah. And, it, and it's been so much fun because I think, you know, for me too, it's not even about, oh, like, needing to monetize something it's another way to stay in touch with my audience yep, you know absolutely. during the pandemic and and creating that sense of community and and i would say too to people you know that that sent that fulfilling that need in your own community is so valuable you know whether it's 20 people 200 people 200,000 yeah. you know it there's so many rewards you should, you could make this a podcast. I mean, that's the yeah. The Actually, the I was going to talk to you about that too. Yeah. I was thinking now I got to MP MP3 it right. Yeah, <laughs> turn them it, into MP3. It pays well. Like this is just as easily mm -hmm. a, a podcast. The the video is is not a requirement. You're not yeah. you know doing anything that you couldn't be an enjoyable audio experience. So yeah, you should just publish to both platforms. Yeah, definitely. It's funny, Heather. What, so, you know how you start something and then as you go along, you kind of get inspired and things grow and change. And that's why everybody should just start, even if you don't know what the heck you're doing, because totally. you never know where it's going to take you. Right. And um, so I've in amongst my interviews, I've had some interviews with um, like I had an interview with Sandy Horn from The Spoons. I remember Sandy Horn. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I interviewed May Potts from oh, yeah. yeah. So and then I've got another guest next week, which I'll tell you off air because it's a big surprise too. But Ooh. but it's really cool because that's kind of like um, my thing, like the eighties and the women. Like it's like it, not that they're lost women of the eighties, but when you look these women up on Google, no one's sat down with them and had a long interview. Nobody's got to know them outside of the band with the men, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, and, you know, and, and lovely May, May Potts. Part of our youth, right? And She's totally a part of our youth. And she was, it was so cool to hear her talk about like the early days at CFNY and how nothing was regulated and they could just bring in whatever albums they had you know, and play them. But but she formed our youth, right? For you and me, like it's it's important stuff. So it's really, really cool. Phoenix when I was a bartender there because the, the the radio stations would broadcast, like CFMY oh. would broadcast and 107.1 would broadcast on a, a night a week. So yeah, I knew May. Yeah. Um, I was a bartender. I mean, that's our relationship, but <laughs> great role in those days, let me tell you. Oh, no kidding. I probably saw you there at the Phoenix. And yeah, you, you probably did. You probably made me a Long Island iced tea. I'm sure tea. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's so great. And, you know, talking to you today, Heather, I've just enjoyed it so much because um, the podcast, you know, platform, it's, it's fascinating and it's something that not every all of us know everything about or how do you start your own how do you do it yeah, um totally. yeah it's really great and i love all these stepping stones that you've taken to get you there and bravo on being you know a woman in the late 80s early 90s that decided that she was going for it with chum and city and all of that because that was i mean that's right sister get her done yeah it's a dream it is. Well, I realized I couldn't sit around all, you know, I found my ambition um, and went yeah. for it. it. Just doesn't, it's not always there when you, uh, when you're looking for it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And just quickly, cause I know you, um, you've got a busy schedule, but I do want to know, was it your mom and dad who helped give you that confidence to just go for it and do it? Or do you think you were born with that? What was it about you, Heather, that... I don't know the answer to that. I, I, 
you know, probably a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was a very typical upbringing. Um, but a, at some point I, I knew what I needed to do to get to where I wanted to go. Um, and then it was just like one little step at a time. Amazing. Um, you know, I wasn't going to get somewhere. I wasn't going to get into the building unless I volunteered. So it was just committing myself to late nights and early mornings as a not forever, just a uh, means to an end. And, you know, just take one step one day at a time and, you know, it all unfolds. Yeah. Awesome. How did you meet your husband? Um, in the television business, actually. Um, okay. Like long before we got together, I met him. He was he was in the TV business and somewhere somewhere in the TV world we met in some maybe even yeah. in England I can't even remember and just sort of stayed yeah. in touch and then when the time was right um, and we were both single we met up and um, he came over to watch a movie and he hasn't left yet and that was, uh, <laughs> over ten years ago and do you I love it. do you remember what the movie was No I don't think we watched a movie Okay um, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> if it, we must have, it would have been a black and white film noir. He's he's big into old films, and he's introduced me to the the beauty of film noir and and some the classics that I hadn't paid attention to. So it was something along those lines. But yeah, he and we've been watching movies pretty much every night since. So oh, um, I love it. There's actually you may have already seen it. There's an amazing documentary that Gina Davis did all about the film industry and how it was dominated by women before. They brought sound into movies and then yeah. all of a sudden men took, did you see that? No, uh, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. I'll yeah. send you the link. I can't remember the name of it, but oh, it's, it's really, really good. So yeah, you and your hubby would love that. Yeah. Heather, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You're fantastic. I loved, loved, loved talking to you. No thank problem. You. I'm going to put you in our virtual green room. Help thank yourself you. to champagne and caviar. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. What a wonderful interview. I absolutely love chatting with Heather. Um, if you have time today, please go and visit our sponsor's uh, website, brandabadome.com and grab yourself some cozy clothes for winter time. And remember to use the coupon code, get to know her for 21% off of your order. Check out our three little wishes necklaces at glamjewels.com. Help support a family this Christmas. Thank you all so much for your time. Thanks for being here and keep on showing the world your sparkle. We'll see you back here next week.